We're going to talk about uh, marketing, and I kind of define that loosely as the journey that we take someone on from the point where they've never heard of us till they become one of our paying clients. And so that's the goal of, of marketing and advertising in general. And so what we're going to do, everything I talk about really, uh, while it's sort of geared toward the website, it's really appropriate to overall marketing strategy. So I think that's what we're going to think of in, in terms of the, the reason for this uh, meeting today. So uh, what, what we do with our marketing is we use various tools uh, to leverage our, our tutoring, our teaching businesses. I use tutoring and teaching interchangeably. I know a lot of people have debates on, on that, but um, the, uh, the client doesn't really have a, a debate. Same thing with, I say ESL and a lot of people, different places say it differently, but I think most clients don't really care what you and I call it. Uh, they, they know that they need to learn English and they know that uh, the person that can help them has, you know, could be a tutor or a teacher or whatever. All right, so so we're talking about websites, and a lot of people will tell you, hey, well, websites don't work, and and you know that's that's absolutely true. A bad website won't work. A bad advertisement won't work. Uh, a bad TV commercial won't work. So let's think for a second why a marketing material would not be effective, and one of the reasons would be poor focus. What I mean by that, um, you and I are going to teach something or we're going to tutor something. Well, first thing is, what are we going to do? Are we going to teach English? Are we Are going to teach German? Oh, okay, I don't speak German, so that narrows it down. I'm going to teach English. Uh, who? Who am I going to teach it to? Um, well, I really like kids. I have grandchildren, and so I think maybe I'll teach um, kids up until the age of 10. Oh, well, actually, I'm not really that good with kids, to tell the truth. Um, maybe I'm going to teach adults. Okay, yeah, so that's what I want to do. Um, so, personally, I teach adults. I get the uh, occasional high school senior who's preparing to take a TOEFL exam for as part of the acceptance process into an English-speaking university. But primarily, my target audience are uh, adults. Now. Who do I want to teach? Well, I guess I want to teach anybody who will, will uh, give me a check that doesn't bounce. That's my ideal client. But, you know, I can narrow it down further. Do I want to teach beginners? I mean, that's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's pretty easy. Hello, my name is, and that's where we start. But personally, I've sort of decided that I want to teach TOEFL, IELTS, OET-type candidates. Uh, and right just a little under half of my current students, and I have right now I have, I think, 23 active students. I kind of set a limit of 20, but um, and now I've, I've exceeded that by a, a little. But um, about half of those people are medical professionals. I have an ENT surgeon, I have a dentist, I have an ophthalmologist, um, uh, a dermatologist, uh, a pharmacist. These are people that need to demonstrate proficiency in English as part of their licensing uh, process in the United States. Uh, so I like I like them because they're they're pretty dedicated. You don't become a a doctor by slacking off. So I don't really have to remind them uh, to do homework, to do assignments, to be on time for class. Uh, so the focus is. Um, who do you who do you want to teach? Who's your ideal client? If you don't know that, then a lot of your targeting, a lot of your messaging could be could be off. Okay, so uh, websites that do work well, they're they're ones that target a specific niche. Who is your ideal client? Uh, and so then you use content that drives visitors to your website to a specific action. And what's the specific action you want them to do? Uh, somebody might say, oh, I want them to enroll, I want to sign up for classes. And, uh, hi, Sarah. Uh, Caesar, you're saying what happened, but I'm still here, uh, so I hope nothing happened. <laughs> um, is anybody having trouble? Is anybody... Uh, 
Anybody still hear me? Give me a give me a wave. Uh, I, everything here looks like I'm I'm broadcasting. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't remember where where I was exactly. So I'm going to sort of cover part of those comments. All right. So what what we do? We have to define who our target audience is, who our ideal candidate is. That helps us uh, refine our marketing materials. All right, so let's talk about the website at first. You design a website, you call your mother and say, hey, mom, look at my website. And she says, oh, it's beautiful. Now, that's sort of bad news. <laughs> I don't want my mother thinking my website is beautiful and that's the only comment she makes because, let's see. Okay, good, we're good. Okay, so uh, because our website shouldn't focus on our creativity. Uh, I mean, unless our unless what we do is sell graphics design or something like that, then creativity is is not the goal of our our website. Um, so focusing on how pretty it looks is probably a uh, that doesn't mean a pretty website can't can't be effective. But if that's your goal, then that's a mistake. So our website is kind of like this guy selling magazines. Uh, sometimes these people are open 24 hours a day, and that's what your website should do. It should be your best salesperson 24-7. Um, now, I know there are a lot of free sites available, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I was going to say I'm not critical of them. Uh, in general, I'm not supportive of them simply because they make really, really pretty sites, but they rarely help you uh, fit into a web strategy. In fact, to my knowledge, they don't really even talk that much about web strategy. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with e-commerce. If you're selling t-shirts on your website, I, I don't really have any input on, on that. But if you're ready to remodel or launch a new site and you want to generate leads for your tutoring business, for your teaching business, then that's, uh, that's what I would like to, uh, to share with you. So why would you listen to me? Because I'm, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm, uh, I'm not a computer programmer. I'm not even a professional website designer. However, I did design my first website in 1994, and I have done hundreds of websites over the years. Um, and one of the reasons I had to do that, I, I was the uh, managing director of a marketing communications company and an advertising agency for a period. I also was vice president of a language institute and uh, technical college. Uh, I was also a professional photographer. Um, clearly, I have not had long meetings with guidance counselors, but uh, I just sort of followed the path that was in front of me and, and made those decisions as they uh, as they appeared. As uh, somebody once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> All right, so. We're not going to focus simply on, on web design. We're really going to talk about the web strategy. Okay. Uh, what we want to do is drastically increase the leads from prospective clients. And a prospective client is somebody who can can you who needs and can, can use what you offer, somebody you can help, and somebody that can afford to pay you to do it. Uh, otherwise, you're running a charity or running a, a hobby. So. Um, you probably figured out by now it takes some kind of an investment uh, uh, monetarily, but it also takes time and effort. So if you have thousands of dollars to go off to pay to a web designer, then there's no reason to listen to, to me because I, I have nothing to sell you. Uh, you can't pay me to do your website. Um, but if you're willing to invest a little bit of money and learn, then this is probably uh, time worth well spent for you. All right, so. If you didn't have to worry about where your next client was coming from, how would you feel? I mean, you might be here because you're just between classes and you have dozens of students and you don't have any more room and you're checking account, account for more money. Um, if that's uh, your reason for being here, then you know, you're welcome. But it's probably not the case for most of us. So, by the way, I happen to use the term client, customer, student interchangeably. I use parent, customer, whoever's handing me the credit card or writing the check. That's kind of what I, what I mean when I talk about the customer. Um, 
and I don't really care if you teach K through 12, if you teach uh, in a university setting, or if you, like me, prefer to teach professionals who need to demonstrate their proficiency in, in English, then um, I, I think this is something that uh, is a benefit to you, and I don't, I don't really care where you fall in there, as long as you know where you fall. Again, you have to identify what your target is. So, your website. Unless you're just looking for an electronic brochure, I hear people say, oh, I want to get the word out there, out where. <laughs> I want people to know we exist. Well, yeah, that's a good thing, but it should be part of a larger, a larger strategy. Um, now, sometimes we fall into a trap, and that trap is called social media. It's called sales funnels and other things that people will sell you that um, they say will replace your website. But remember, social media is just one of many tools. The website is your anchor. You want to drive traffic to the website, not out to your social media. And let me let me give you an analogy. You own a, uh, a jewelry store down on Main Street. And three blocks away, there's a busy corner and there's a bus stop. And you notice there's an available... Uh, signage on the bus shelter or on the back of the bus bench where you can put an advertisement. So you contract to do that. And it just simply says, my jewelry store, three blocks that way. All right. When people come into your jewelry store, I'm suspecting that you don't say, hey, did you see my, my bus bench down the street? Why don't you go down and take a look at that? All right. That's essentially what happens when people come to our website and we have all these little icons that take them back out to our Facebook page, our Instagram account. No, no. You want them in the website. That's where you can sort of guide them on this journey. All right. So and, and that's different from the ones you have little icons that say sh where they can share. They can share your content on their Facebook page. That's good. You want that to happen but you don't want icons that take them back to your social media accounts. All right, so once we have them in there, uh, we, want, we want them to begin to feel comfortable with us, and we want to share the information they're looking for, but we don't want to overwhelm them with dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of information which might be interesting to us, but they could care less about. Um, your your goal is to give them enough information that they're interested, and they're interested enough to contact you. Now, when we say contact us, we, we don't I don't I'm not talking about a, one of these little forms that says contact us. Why? Why are they contacting us? We have to sort of guide them to that, and um, I I try and avoid the phrase contact us. I, I would rather them schedule a consultation with me. Uh, I know it's a little thing, but I generally don't say schedule a free consultation because I think then it, then it a value pro attaches a value proposition. Oh, it's free. Okay, I can keep that appointment or not. <laughs> All right. So what I prefer to do is talk about a no-obligation consultation. So how do I get them from that point where they just found me to they're going to give me their email address? Or, or click on, um, I use Calendly, by the way. Uh, so how do I get them to do that? Well, uh, remember, they don't know us. When they get to our website, they are in what we call research mode. They're going to come to our website. They're probably going to go to five or ten websites in, in a sitting. Um, you have someone around three, four, five seconds to catch their attention and get them to go a little bit deeper into your website, otherwise, boom, off to to your competition. Now, even if you have a really great website and you have great information, don't make the mistake of thinking, well, I know they're going to go off and look at other sites, but they'll come back. Well, no, they won't. They don't know you. At least you know, a minute ago, they had never heard of you. So we have to give them a reason to come back. And the better way to do that is, we call it a sales funnel. Don't let that turn you off, because again, you'll hear, you'll hear sales funnels don't work. And, and that's true. 
Today's sales funnels probably aren't the same as they were 10 or 15 years ago. It used to be we would just give away something free like a, an ebook, and people would, but there's so much free information available online that just giving that free information is probably not enough for them to give up their email address. And the reason, of course, they want their email address is so that we can provide something of value to them and stay in front of them. Because remember, they went and visited 10 sites. Well, we want to be the one or two that they remember. And so having a way to contact them, I don't mean every day, I don't mean spam in their inbox, but I mean just having a way to uh, have them develop some confidence in you, uh, some, uh, some trust. You know, there's an old saying in sales, people buy from people they know, people they like, and people they trust. All right, so our first goal is to get them to know us. They're on our website. We have to somehow find a way to keep in contact with them. Once we do that, if we're not spamming, but we're providing legitimately valid information, uh, they sort of go down that path toward, toward trusting us. Now, we're all nice people. We're all trustworthy. It's just that they don't know us yet. So we just sort of have to show them how we, uh, how we can benefit them. All right, so... You have to lay things out in a very clear and precise way that persuades the visitor to take action. And that take action thing is something like um, like giving you their email address so that you can give them something of value to them. But before we get to that, <laughs> one of the things that you have to first do, you have to touch the pain points. Now, you hear that term a lot in marketing. What that means is your prospective client has a problem. They're looking for a solution. You and I have to position ourselves as the solution to those problems. Um, an easy problem. I'm living in the United States for the last couple of years and I nobody understands me. I can barely read the newspaper. I, uh, I can't really get a job above maybe um, bus and tables. Um, it's clear to me that I need to become more fluent in English. So I need to improve my ability. Okay, that's my problem. I don't speak English well enough to be, uh, be employable. Oh, interestingly, we provide solutions to that. So we want to make sure that the problem they have is something that we can solve. All right. The way we do that, we have to be very clear and very simple. Remember, three to five seconds. That's about the time they have to make them want to stick around your website and see a little bit more. So let's talk about the essential pages, uh, what you absolutely need to have on your website, and a little bit about what it needs to say. Um, so we're going to start with the home page. Everybody has a home page. It's generally the place people go the first time they come to your website. Uh, we may have other pages for specific purposes that are sometimes called landing pages. Um, but for most people, the home page is the, the landing page. So again, clarity and simplicity. So let's start. You know when you get a newspaper, uh, we use the term above the fold. Normally newspapers are folded. And above the fold is the, uh, the name of the paper, the headline, the picture, and the main story. And when you flip it over, you have the other stuff down at the bottom. I guess it depends on how you pick the paper up. But the term is above the fold. So on a website, above the fold is what people first see when they come to your site. It's kind of what fits on, on your screen when you first get there. And uh, depending how the website's designed, you may have a lot of menu items to click on to sort of go horizontally. Or maybe on, particularly on a mobile device like your phone, the, the sites are res what we call responsive websites, and they just go scrolling almost to infinity. They can just keep going down, down, down. Um, anyway, the hero section is the first thing they see, regardless of what device they're using. It's the top part of your page. Um, so it's the first impression that people have of your brand. And, and in fact, if you're in business, you are a brand. So it has to tell people what you do, what I do. It has to tell them why what we do helps them. Because they don't really care what we do. 
except as it relates to them. And then we have to tell them what they need to do to get it. So they come with a problem. We provide a solution and we show them how they can get that solution. So uh, there are three main points to an effective hero section, the top part of the web page. The first is the headline. The second is a subheadline, and the third is a call to action. So let's talk about that, because this is really, really important. If you don't get anything else out of this, please get this, because this is the this is the stuff that can make or break your website. So that headline has to be based on your ideal client's overall need or desire. That thing that you can help them with, that problem that they have that you can solve. So if you haven't identified your ideal client, is your ideal client the, the parents of a, uh, of a grade school child and they're just afraid they're going to get behind? Uh, because of the pandemic, they're afraid that they're, uh, they're losing um, the opportunity to learn. Um, maybe they just, oh, I don't have time to help them with homework, so they look for a tutor that can just sort of monitor the homework. Um, I, I don't know what, you know, what their, their goal is. You have to decide who you want. In my case, I prefer somebody who's preparing for the TOEFL exam. Uh, so I would have a different message than, uh, than a person who's tutoring grade school children. All right. So you have to kind of decide who, who do you want to teach? Who's your ideal client? And you direct everything toward that client. So what is the problem they have? What is it they want when they come to your website, when they start researching? Now, I, excuse me, I know they're coming for information, but I don't want you to be informational. I want you to be intentional. You have to show the final transformation, what we call the after state, that occurs because they worked with you. In other words, you have to show how you can benefit them benefit them. So as a minimum, a minimum, you want to show exactly what you do and why it's important to them. You want to show the problem that you serve. And in the best of all worlds, you want to show the transformation that occurs because that client worked with you. Be intentional. Be intentional. Okay, show the transformation. Don't be informational. All right, so I don't know. I, I don't know what you, I mean, I guess you teach English or you wouldn't be here, but let's, uh, let's say, for example, you want to use a headline like, is your child struggling with math? Is your child struggling with reading? Is your child struggling with, with speaking, with writing, with reading, with grammar, whatever it is, is your child struggling with that? Okay. Well, we, we tutor kids so that they won't get left behind or we're there to help with homework when you can't be. So you see, I have a major headline, which is pretty much in the form of a question designed to attack the problem they're facing. Ah, well, now I can give them a solution. You know, we tutor kids in that situation. And we're here. We're here to help. All right, so now I just have to put a little call to action in there. Click here to schedule your no obligation consultation didn't sell them anything didn't sell them anything you know because they're they're we have to respect the buying cycle when they first come to your website they're really not there to buy they're kind of like the window shopper they're out on the sidewalk they're looking in maybe you know they see something they like and they walk in um, today depending on your age you may not have done a lot of that uh, that type of shopping but when you walk in the door to a boutique somebody will say Hi, can I help you? And it's like we all went to school with master's degrees and saying, um, no thanks, I'm just looking. I mean, I do that all the time. I'm in there to buy a pair of knee length black socks, <laughs> but no thanks, I'm just looking. Because we do kind of want to look around, but what, what we're really saying is I'm, I'm here to buy something. I'm not here for you to sell me something. We all love to buy, but none of us really like to be sold. All right, so this is the stage they're in there at the window shopping. We're getting them to walk in the door and look around, but we're still not trying to sell anything because they're not ready yet. All right? So we have to nurture. We have to nurture this this lead, this prospect. 
Okay, so you need to make sure that they see very clearly what you do and why it matters to them. Because you do a lot of things that don't have any, any importance to them. So you have to show them what you do and why it matters. Now, uh, I don't know if, if you're in the United States, you may be familiar with the progressive insurance commercials. I think they're very clever, they're fun, I like them. I never bought insurance from them. Um, so headlines in particular, they don't have to be clever, they just have to be clear. And, and that's what your marketing needs to be. Everybody likes the Super Bowl uh, commercials because they're usually, usually uh, pretty clever. But I don't know if anybody ever picks up the phone and buys something as a result of a, of a Super Bowl commercial. Uh, so what we have to do is, remember, three to five seconds. Uh, we have to be very clear and show them the transition that happens, identify their problem, the transition that happens as we provide the solution. Three to five seconds or they're gone. All right, so we have to do it in, with a bit of simplicity. Um, I, yeah, I'm sure you've all seen a Nissan Xterra. When it first came out, and I, I don't know, that was 15 years ago, probably, maybe more. It was an SUV, but it was very basic. didn't have a lot of sound padding. It didn't have, a, I mean, you know, it had tires, had a radio, had windows. They might be the door cranks rather than the automatic. But they had a commercial, and the tagline was, everything you need and nothing you don't. You know, some of us buy things because we just want to show off, but most of us buy things at the price that's the best we can get to get the highest value. At least that's what you want to do. So that's kind of what we have to do. We want to be sim simple and clear. We can provide everything you need, but really nothing nothing you don't. That's why, why technical colleges appeal to people. Uh, I want to go learn how to... Uh, fix a computer or replay, repair a transmission. And I don't necessarily see why reading Shakespeare helps me with that. Um, so anyway, we want to uh, talk about the transformation that occurs, what their problem was, and how we can provide that solution. So this is the guiding rule that your website should have. You include enough information to, wait, to make them want more. Uh, but you don't give them so much information that they think, okay, now I have everything I need so I can make a decision. Because the decision might not be the one you want them to make. Uh, and if you're really good at what you do, it might not be the most beneficial decision. So you want them to accept your call to action. So your call to action. Remember, the hero section, the headline. Um, what do they want or need when they come to your site that you can help them with? Keep it simple, make it easier for the visitor so they know what to do next. They're on a journey, but only you really know where that journey is supposed to end and the path to get there. So tell them what to do next. Okay. All right, now we have to give them what we sometimes call the about page because they kind of like to know who the heck we are. So again, they need to, to, to like and trust us, but before they can do that, they kind of have to know who we are. So. Uh, what you do is tell them what you fundamentally stand for or, or against um, that your ideal client would agree with. Uh, you have to understand them because you used to be them. Um, in my case, I was a, a, a junior at the University of Pittsburgh when I got a draft notice. So this is in 1966. So you don't have to take off your shoes and count. I'm 75. Uh, so I was a junior at Pitt, and I got this uh, letter in the mail that invited me to come join my Uncle Sam's army. And so I called my dad, who, by the way, was a retired army officer, going back to before the Second World War. And he said, oh, don't worry, just get down to the recruiting center tomorrow and find the Navy recruiter, tell me you want to be in a big boat out of rifle range and you want to learn a technical skill. So I went. I went at lunchtime, and he was at lunch. But the Air Force recruiter was there, and he explained that the Air Force didn't actually have any big boats, but they had a lot of cinder uh, block, usually air-conditioned buildings with a lot of electronics equipment. Uh, if I could pass the aptitude test, they would send me to an electronics school for a year. And so I thought, well, that sounds good. And I did well on the test. Remember, this is 1966. And he said, oh, man. He said, what do you want? You want to be in computers? 
And I'm thinking, why? I mean, like, yeah, I know we have a computer, the Americans. I'm sure the Russians have a computer too. Maybe it's some big university, but what, what I do, why? Why would I want to be involved in computers? Remember, it's 1966. We had a thing called heavy ground radio equipment repair, and I thought, everybody I know has a radio. So that's what I took. Little did I learn that, that I know, once you plug it into the wall, it doesn't make any difference if the thing on this end is a radio or a computer or whatever it is. The electronics work the same. So I ended up spending a lot of time working on computers over the years. So uh, when I finished that, actually in the process of that, um, somebody noticed that I had uh, several education credits on my transcript. Now remember, I hadn't finished. Um, they let me finish that semester, so I still had my um, I had three semesters, three semesters to finish. Uh, so that three semesters, by the way, took twelve years. So when I say I know you because I was you, um, I was an adult learner. I didn't just get up, go to bed, go I mean go to class, come home, go to bed, or go to a party or eat lunch. I had uh, I was raising a family. Uh, in fact, I managed to get divorced twice in that period. But I had a job, I had a family, I had responsibilities, and I was going to night school or weekends. When, whenever I could find a class that I could in, get into, and it didn't make any difference what what the subject was. If there was a class, I was taking it. And at some point, I looked at my transcripts, and I had over 140 semester hours. Now, as you may know, somewhere around 130 is what you usually need for, for a bachelor's degree. But I didn't have any kind of a major. Originally, I was a political science major, and I had some education. Um, I had, I, my minor was education. So um, I found myself living in a place where I could go to the University of Maryland and, and finish. But um, <clears throat> I came to, to teaching not, uh, I didn't go get a bachelor's, get a master's, get a teaching credential. I didn't do it that way. I was an industrial trainer. I taught adults how to repair computers, how to uh, how to launch satellites. I spent eight years in the Air Force and six years uh, with the NASA, and actually three years as an instructor, civilian instructor in the in the Navy. So I did a lot of curriculum design, a lot of teaching. Then, as the world turned, I found myself teaching English as a second language to the immigrant population in Southern California, and I spent 11 years doing that. Met my wife. No, I didn't rob the cradle. We've been married. Uh, it'll be 30 years next um, next June. And uh, I just explained she needed extensive homework, so I just brought her home. Um, so I taught a lot of a lot of adults, uh, and I think it gave me some insights that I might not have. And I'm nothing wrong. I have a lot of relatives who have. You know, they have their masters and their teachers, and and uh, that's the, the path that, that they chose or work was available to them. Um, but but anyway, I, I like to show my students, because they're adults, that I was an adult learner. I understand that they have jobs, they have families, and now they also have me. And I like them to see how that's a, a, a positive thing. All right, so now let's go. To, so that's the home page, the landing page. It's the about me. Um, you can you can trust me and like me because I was you. I was you. Also, you know, I have the, the, another story. I went, I, when I worked for the NASA, I was sent to uh, South America as the operations controller of a NASA satellite tra tracking station. My Spanish was. Uh, I'm pretty sure I knew the difference between hello and goodbye, you know, hola and hasta luego, uh, although I might have learned that when I got there. But I spent three months reading the newspaper. <laughs> no, not the same newspaper, although I didn't actually get a new one every day. But I would sit there with my coffee and the dictionary, and I would read when I wasn't at work. Uh, at work, I could speak English. Um, at some point, I saw this girl. I asked her to go to dinner, and she said no. And I got up my dictionary, I looked up no, and... That's the same as in English. I need to uh, be able to speak a little more fluently in Spanish. So I understand the frustration of being a 30-year-old and having that mentality and those ideas, but having the vocabulary of maybe a three-year-old. If you haven't had that experience, I'm sure many of you have, but uh, it's, it's frustrating. So uh, I make sure that my students, uh, my prospective students, know that. 
Okay, so we have to build some credibility and authority, and um, they have to sort of get a picture what working with you would look like and what the results could be that after state. All right, so on your testimonial page, the best thing in the world is a video of, even if it's just a minute long, maybe two minutes, of a really happy, successful student who just gushes about how how good it was working with you. All right, well, sometimes it's a little hard to get those. Um, so maybe you can get a quote with a photo. Okay, you don't have a photo. All right, get the quote. And on the quote, identify their first name and what what they do or where they're from. Uh, I, I happen to have, uh, uh, I don't know how many, five, six, seven, maybe a few more. And I put the name of the person, the first name, I put the country, the firm, I put the job they do. And I, since I don't have photos of everybody, I put the flag of the country they're from. Now, if you have two videos and Three with three quotes with photos and six quotes without photos, that's fine. Use them all. Put them up there. Okay. Because it gives you credibility. All right, now everybody has an FAQ page, frequency asked questions. What do you think they're for? Uh, to give information? Eh, no, not really. Because um, remember, you want to give them enough information so that they think, oh, I want more information. So what the FAQ page is for really is to overcome objections. Uh, I find with adult ESL learners, uh, the two major objections are, I don't have time and oh, it costs too much. Well, I, I guess, you know, with in a gentle way, you have to say, what does it cost you not to be able to speak English? Okay, you're, you're a, a physician in the United States. You're not going back to Jordan. You need a license from a state. And one of the requirements is a demonstration of English proficiency. And most boards require, some require IELTS, some the OET, but most require the TOEFL. What is it costing you to go another year working essentially as an intern? Oh, yeah, maybe they call it a fellowship, uh, but it's not your own practice. Uh, you, you don't really control where you work or when you work. Uh, it's not what being a physician probably was in your dream. Helping people is great. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy, people, happy people decide to become physicians. Um, but I think if they undersell themselves and can't actually practice by themselves, even though they're qualified, minus uh, the ability to demonstrate English proficiency, then they owe themselves to develop that proficiency and be able to get the high scores on the TOEFL exam. So what does it cost you not to pass? And I, you don't pass or fail TOEFL. You get, you get a score, and depending on the institute, that you're applying to or the purpose of it, it, it could be a different score. Um, so anyway, you, you want to overcome these objections up front as early as possible. You won't want them to be smiling, yes, 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 uh, and I charge $97 an hour. No. Well, and by the way, if you charge $97 an hour, I want you to do this webinar because I, I, I'm not making that. But... Um, but some people, I guess, uh, are. Anyway, what you want to do is make them see you, how they, they fit in the value, how you fit in their value proposition. Um, so time, I don't have time. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have doctors that work 12 hours a day and get one day off, and sometimes they get called in on that day. And, well, you know what? Medical school wasn't e easy either, and it took time. And so this is just part of the process. It, it is what it is, and if you want to continue to progress in your career, then you just have to decide, yes, this is my priority. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons I decided I wanted to work with, uh, with professionals. All right, pricing, pricing. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not putting the price on. They see that, they'll run away. And I'm going to tell you, if they don't see it, they're going to run away. They're going to run to your competitor who does have the prices on the page. 
and and I'm not necessarily saying I used to be a wedding photographer. I spent 20 years as a professional photographer, and back and I've been retired for many years. But back in the 2000s, if you went to my website, you would see under pricing not how much an album cost, how much pages cost, how much hours cost. You would just simply see my prices start at three thousand dollars but my average couple budgets five thousand dollars all right there's the range three to five if you were thinking you were going to spend 500 bucks get two photographers get them from eight in the morning till midnight and get a leather bound album um, good luck but it's not me and it's okay because we can't not everyone's our ideal client all right so it's the same thing with this. If uh, if your target audience are people that can't afford more than minimum wage to pay the the tutor, then uh, you either accept that that's what they're going to pay you, you're going to make fifteen bucks an hour, or you're going to target people who can afford to pay thirty five, forty five, fifty five, whatever whatever it is that that you charge. But you have to give them something. So give them a range. Uh, maybe you can say, well, it depends on the results of the placement test. I love the placement test. <laughs> That's my major marketing tool once I'm talking to them. Um, all right. So we somehow have to qualify the, the client. Yeah, I don't want to spend an hour on a video chat with somebody who's thinking, okay, uh, I think I can get this guy for $15 an hour. And then... An hour later, we're both disappointed because I can't afford to work for $15 an hour. And if they can't uh, find a way to make uh, what they're willing to pay a high, uh, something higher than that, then um, you know we've, we've just unfortunately both wasted that that hour. Okay. So the prospect's looking for this information. Your pricing. Um, you can be transparent with them. Just tell them. Uh, if I don't give them to them, they're going to go to the competitions page till they find somebody who does. Not everyone is your target audience. So we go back to the one of the first things I said. Identify your ideal client. Part of being an ideal client for me is somebody that can afford $45 an hour for 30 hours or 60 hours or whatever. whatever because, you know, you don't teach the TOEFL in, in, uh, over two weekends. Uh, well, well, you could probably teach how to take the exam. But um, but I don't do that. I want to build the foundation. Uh, if their grammar sucks, that no matter how many tips and techniques I give them for writing answers to the test, they're probably not going to pass it. So I want to build that foundation. All right. So that's not going. Rarely am I going to do that in the, in a couple of hours. So we have to make that clear. All right. So the appointment of the scheduling page. It's not the contact us. It's um, it's contact me by scheduling your no obligation consultation. I put a time on it, 30 minutes, so they know what they're getting into. Um, by the way, I'll, I'll do the same for you. If you want to continue this conversation when this is over, uh, I'm willing to spend 30 minutes talking with a few of you. It's not every day. I'll put the I'll give you, it's on Calendly, I'll give you the link. I'm nothing to sell you, it's it's the same charge as what you're paying for this, it's it's, it's nothing. Um, I'm sort of, I'm not housebound, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in an area where if I go too many places, I'm gonna be surrounded by a lot of people who don't care so much about my health. Um, so I tend to be in the house, unless I'm sort of taking my dog out to one of the two big trees that he pees on every day. Um, so I'm here, and I'd rather be talking to you than nobody. Um, I, I limit myself to just over 20 students, um, but I'm essentially available from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. my time. Uh, so there's plenty of time for people to, to contact me. All right, so anyway, that's... That's just the scheduling thing. I use Calendly. I know there are a lot of options. You could do other things. But what does it do? It gives them, it gives you their email address. That's not really a sales funnel. I use something else for that. And if we still have time, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, so anyway, it's not a contact us page. You need to embed an actual scheduling tool so they can 
physically get onto your calendar. And then you just call them at the time that they choose. I mean, you, with Calendly, you get a notice, they get a notice, and uh, you can even give them the link to, I use Zoom, you can give them the link. What I generally do is 10 to 15 minutes before I send them a, an invitation, it just gives them the same address that they had. But it does two things. <laughs> it lets me know, hey, I've got somebody to talk to in in uh, 10 minutes, and it reminds them that they have uh, that I'm there. I'm, I'm waiting for them. All right, but they get to choose the time based on what I make available. <clears throat> okay, so that's what you need. There might be some pages that you'd like to have, maybe a services page, because I know a lot of you tutor more than one thing. Um, I uh, so you might have separate services pages, or you might have a services page with sections. Um, you kind of need to decide what your main thing is and highlight that. But if there are other things that are sort of uh, um, nearly the same, that the same type of person might need, you can list those. But anyway, the services page is, is fine. So it really depends on what services you you actually uh, offer. If, if they need separate explanations, then maybe you need separate pages. <clears throat> if you have some case studies. Wonderful. Case studies, much better than than even testimonials. And if the case study includes a testimonial, home run. All right. <clears throat> so everything else is clutter. It's fluff. Leave it out. Don't put it there. It just gets them lost. You want to take them from, hey, I found this guy to here's where I scheduled that no obligation uh, consultation. In between, you give them the reasons why. And you lay out the path. You're guiding them. So fluff, clutter, no, that's not what it's for. All right, so you give them everything they know, nothing they don't need. Did you hear that before? Um, just, just don't add to the confusion. They're going to look at 10 websites. Uh, they're going to be confused. You want to get their email address. You want to have that consultation. So that, to me, is the best lead funnel in the world. Um, but there's other ways to have lead funnels. One of the things I do, and many of you have, um, have heard of read theory, um, I, uh, I don't, I don't know that I have time to go into the whole f uh, Facebook ad thing, but essentially I offer, uh, I target TOEFL candidates and I offer them read theory at no charge. And I send them a message every couple of weeks, just reminders, just a congratulations on how well they're doing. Uh, I sent one of those recently to some of you who had attended a webinar like this that I'd done once before, and one of the guys uh, unsubscribed. I guess he didn't get that I was just giving him, showing him what I do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I watch to see how they do on the read theory, and if they're working consistently, uh, then I feel it's time to maybe suggest they want face-to-face -face lessons. Some of them say yes. Some of them aren't ready for it. I don't care. It didn't cost me essentially anything. The, if you do Facebook ads correctly, it's not going to cost you more than a couple of dollars. Um, I got 100 people sign up for it. Ten of them work it, and one of them enrolls, and it cost me three bucks to get them. It's a good deal. So uh, it's that, the advertising thing is, is probably a little different category. Um, just remember that that. Somewhere above 80, 90 percent of the people that first come to your website, they're, they're just doing research. That's all they're doing. That's what we do when we go to websites. Hey, let me check this out. Okay, so if you don't grab them right away, they're not going to come back because, heck, <laughs> they don't know where they were. Um, so they're going to go to 10 or 15 sites. Uh, you have to be the one who sticks in their mind. So if they sign up for the Read Theory program, then you can see how they're doing. You, there's no really, you don't have to be actively involved. You know, read, if you haven't che um, checked out Read Theory, I encourage you to, excuse me, encourage you to do it. Um, and then you can see what kind of results they're getting, and you can see who is dedicated. And boy, I want to have another conversation with them. I want to show them how I can be of even greater benefit to them with one on one classes. All right, so uh, there's other, other things that would you could define as a lead funnel. For me, it's just the, uh, the call to action to get the no obligation consultation. Um, I rely heavily on the placement test because it makes me look really professional. They do such a good job, and I understand they're even going to improve this test, but as it stands, 
uh, I write an e I don't show them the actual page. I write an email and I put everything in it. And somebody said, well, doesn't that take a lot of time? It, it does, but it kind of becomes, you know, if you write a couple hundred, it kind of becomes uh, pretty easy to do it. But I don't mind spending 10 minutes if it's going to get me somebody that's going to pay me you know, twelve, fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I'll, I'll spend ten minutes writing them an email, but it makes us look very professional. Um, all right, so let's see what else. Um, all right, so this call to action has to be very clear and actionable. It's not just a generic contact us page. It's click here to schedule your consultation. You're no obligation consultation. That's an action with a purpose. Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly, Sarah, if I'm going too long and you need me to shut up, somehow tell me that. Uh, or everybody can just leave and I'll get the idea. Except I can't really see who's there. Um, so uh, what I want to make sure we do Let's see. I have. I, I, I by the way have a slideshow on, on that I'm using as my notes, so I don't forget anything. And um, sometimes I forget where I am on the on the slideshow. Uh, I do a lot of my. I you know I use off the class for probably eighty percent of my curriculum, uh, but I also make a lot of slides, and I do voiceovers or I just do them live with the the student, or. Um, I, I'm not really good at recording them on Zoom and getting the results I want, but sometimes I'll just record them and do a voiceover. So that, that's actually what I'm, I'm not doing a voiceover, uh, but I'm actually referring to the slides. So uh, I will sometimes, uh, I don't if you don't teach TOEFL, by the way, you know, uh, it's a big deal. It's a major part of a professional's academic and professional life. Now, you don't have to teach just, just medical professionals. Like you can teach, teach business owners. Uh, I have a diplomat. Uh, I won't say what country, but uh, I used to own an Alfa Romeo, and he was very, very happy when I told him that. Um, and, I, and I love it. And a lot of what I do is I'll help uh, write uh, letters or even like tomorrow we have a uh, we're going to practice a speech that he has to give and so it's kind of out of the realm uh, actually he's not even taking the TOEFL he's he's just improving his English because he speaks Italian Portuguese he's learning Spanish and English so uh, so I have him and so going outside the realm of off the class is uh, sometimes necessary, and generally I will uh, curate various uh, YouTube type things and have them do that. I will make uh, my own slideshows and, and talk about those, and sometimes I'll even send them the, the PDF uh, when I'm done. Um, all right, I don't know if there's much more. I don't, I don't know if I guess we can ask questions. Um, yeah, let me... Let me see if I can just take some some question. Chris, okay, great stuff, thank you. Um, what are a digital download as a CTA instead of scheduling a consultation? Yeah, you can do that. Um, in fact, that's kind of what the um, the original lead funnels were designed for to give them some kind of a digital download, an ebook. You could make um, you can make checklists, things that would serve a par parent or a uh, prospective student a lot of time so they don't have to do the research that you've done. That's that's okay. Um, everyone offers a free trial, so offering that doesn't make you stand out. Absolutely. I would, I'm not giving free anything. I mean, I am, but I'm not labeling it free uh, because that now establishes value. I don't want to be known as the guy who does all the free stuff. Um, so, uh, so Chris says the, the download is, uh, he recommends it for two reasons. Everybody does, some, does something free, so offering that doesn't make you stand out. Absolutely agree. And the students know it's just going to be a sales pitch. Yes, you're exactly right. So download is a much lower commitment. Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, and um, I, um, I do the, the read theory so I can, me remember now, hey, I, I'm doing... If I have 20 students, I'm happy. I've now 
upgraded my subscription so I can take 30, but it becomes more of a time factor for me. I, again, I'm I'm not 40 years old trying to build a business. I'm I'm 75 years old, and I would be bored silly if I didn't have some students. So it's it may be a different situation, um, but yeah, if I can if I can give them something that's low commitment, um, the read theory is at no cost to me. It's at no cost to them, and I can stay in contact with them. I don't bother them. I mean, I don't give them a daily email. Every Sometimes after the first week, I'll congratulate them on how well they did, and then I might wait. I, I average somewhere around three weeks that I contact everybody, every three weeks. So really, really no, no more than that except right at the beginning. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of my version of the digital download. If it has value, this is the key. What you offer to them has to have, in their mind, enough value that they're willing to give you their email address. That's, that's as simple as it is. Once you have that, then, of course, it depends on the quality of the messaging that you're, you're exchanging with them. Um, John, yeah, I was going to offer off-the-class placement and test consultation. I love that. So here's what I try, and somebody says, do you use it? Yes, I do. Um, what I do is uh, in all... In, in the perfect world, I have them take the placement test. I tell them it's going to take them an hour and a half or so. They can take a break in between. I tell them not to stress over it. It's just, uh, and all I'm doing is trying to measure where they are so I have a better idea of how to get them to where they need to be. And that's my key. Know where you are so I can help you get to where you need to be. That's the purpose of the placement test. But once I get that, I also tell them, we're going to, uh, I tell them right up front, we're also going to do a 30-minute video chat as a further evaluation. Um, I don't know if any of you have the, the situation. A lot of times they don't actually do the listening part. I don't, don't get that result. I, I don't really care because I'm going to talk to them anyway. But in that, I always, I always highlight, this will give you an opportunity to ask any questions. It'll give me an opportunity to explain the process uh, I've given them that email ad, that email that explained what they did on the placement test. I'm now going to talk to them about it. They can ask any questions they want. All right, so that's two-step process I use. Um, so, so Chris says he thinks that's uh, asking too much. No, I don't agree with that, Chris. But uh, out of my 23 students, I mean, you can go look at my records. See how many people I've had take the t the test. Um, Virtually everyone, every student I have has taken the placement test. Uh, every, not everyone took it before I talked to them, but the majority have. Um, but I think it's how you set it up. If you, uh, I, um, I use the approach that they're applying for admission. I'm not selling them something. I'm not selling them in, in English lessons. I'm giving them an opportunity to enroll in my program. And that's how I position it. Uh, I, and that's sort of creating a scarcity proposition for them. Okay, um, can you show us sales figures from inside your website? Well, I don't have any sales figures in my website, uh, but here's here's what I can tell you. Um, a year and a half ago, I was bored silly. Didn't know what I was going to do, and my wife said, why don't you teach? And I had taught photography a lot online. Uh, somewhere earlier I mentioned that I didn't know a wedding photographer for 20 years, full time. That's what I did for a living. But I've been photographing weddings for 50 years, and I was a commercial photographer for a number of years as well. Uh, but I didn't really want to do that, um, and I didn't want to go someplace. And this is pre-COVID, so I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to put on pants. <laughs> I didn't want to go someplace. I wanted to be able to do it right here from my from my uh, second bedroom. And uh, so she said, "Well, what about English?" And so I said, great idea, and I made a mistake. I started designing curriculum because that's kind of who I am. I didn't have a student. What was I designing curriculum for? So, you know, a little while into that, I decided, no, no, that's that's not the way to do it. I need to get a student and design curriculum around that person's needs. So anyway, uh, my goal, we built um, in in October of, of 2018, we began to build a small house uh, south of Guadalajara in Mexico. We finished it a year later, October of 19, and the plan was to move there this past May when my wife turned 65. However, things happened, and 
we ended up with a closed border and not feeling safe about traveling the length of Mexico. And so we're still here. And that date is now Valentine's Day of 2021. Who knows if it'll happen. Um, but I thought that'd be great because when I get there, you know, my Spanish is okay. I can, I can attend to my basic needs and I'm sure it'll get much better when I'm surrounded by it. But I thought, oh, I need something to do. And teaching English seemed like a great thing. And teaching English online, just, you know, I could do that. Just, I have a pair of gym shorts on and a, and a golf shirt. And so it fit into what, what I was looking for. Um, then I found off the class. And I, I, I mean, I'm not kissing butt here, but I'm telling you, it changed my life. Because I now didn't have to spend all that time designing for students I didn't even know yet, you know. James has done that for us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Oh, what's the award behind me? All right. So there's there's two. The one you can't probably see very well is called the Estrella Award. It's a Small Business of the Year Award from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And that was when we were doing the, the marketing. This is the Aurora Gold Award. And this is for... Um, excellence in video or film production. So um, I produced a series of four films for a computer learning center, and we didn't want film. Uh, this, this is a while ago, but we didn't do them on video. We did them on film, and we won. Uh, let's say we. I was the producer, uh, and this uh, was the award that the agency won. But since I owned the agency, I got to get the award. Um, just for context, I'm thinking in terms of the initial lead magnet in change. For, yeah, well, um, the 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 main thing I do is if they get to my website. Now, I, we haven't talked about SEO. We haven't talked about how they find your website in the first place. Uh, so that's probably a whole whole other topic. Um, okay, so uh, let me go back to Chris Huntley. Um, so what I did, my plan was to be ready to teach. Um, around the first of the year and then when we got to Mexico I'd be all set up. Things took off. I started to get um, more and more students. One of the things I did, I took a, Chris Chris Rush has interviewed, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's Jack Askew, A-S-K-E-W maybe. He has a class, of course, uh, I don't remember what it cost, but I think I took it, you know, a year and a half ago or very early on and um, he kept saying, Get your first student. Get your first student. So that's what I uh, what I concentrated on. And even though I taught in the classroom for 11 years, um, I didn't have to market. You know, most of us don't have to market. We, uh, if we're teaching in 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 a school district or in, even in private schools, uh, our problems sometimes too many students. We don't have to go get them. Now all of a sudden. Uh, we're responsible not only for teaching, not only for our lesson plans, but finding the student in the first place. Then we have to think, well, how am I going to price this? So what's my overhead? How do I make sure that I'm not just trading my time for a dollar and breaking even? So we have to do all of those things. And it doesn't happen overnight. So it took me, um, I have a little advantage in that, that I have owned a couple of businesses and, and I was CFO of a of a company that had about 500 employees, all in education. Um, so uh, I had sort of that little bit of an advantage. But still, three months or so into it, I started to get a steady flow. But I mean, there were times when I had five students. And then I'd get a couple more. And sometimes I'd look at my wife and say, I haven't had a lead in, in two weeks. I haven't had anybody give me their email in two weeks. Well key is once you enroll them, you need to keep them. <laughs> and I started selling an hour and then quickly decided that's silly. So I started selling 10, 30, and 60 hours. And I've just uh, dropped the 10 hour thing. Now, if you want 10, because what happens, people would, would hire me for 10 hours and then they'd hire me for 10 more and then they'd hire for 10 more. I get discounts at 20 and six, I mean, sorry, at uh, 30 and 60. So I said, listen, if that's what you want to do, okay, but I feel like I'm taking money from you. You don't have to spend. All right. So what I do is um, tell them the price. I don't, uh, and then I will offer them the opportunity to make two payments, one to start and one at 30 days. Um, 
and how do I take payment? It, it's essentially however they want to give it to me. Um, PayPal is very easy, but you know they, they take a little little percentage. Uh, and Venmo, which is essentially PayPal. Uh, my favorite is Zelly, which if you have a U.S. bank, if your client has a U.S. bank account, you can send them um, to that, and there's no charge. It's immediate almost. You know, you get it. Well, this, you know, a few minutes after they send it. And then uh, I use uh, TransferWise if they need to pay in a currency that isn't a dollar. And it allows you to keep accounts in several uh, um, currencies. So if, if you have people that are paying you in euros and you sometimes have expenses in euros, you can just keep it in the account as a euro. You don't have to do these conversions. Uh, if you don't have that need, then of course you can just con convert them. Okay, let me see. Uh, and for real, I hate to work for call centers in Mexico. So I think, Mary, I might maybe miss the first thing you were saying there. Let me scroll back up. Oh, okay, Mary. Uh, okay, John, took Jack's class, great information, well worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know about you, John, but I'm not some kind of an affiliate. <laughs> I'm not even sure how to say his last name, but yeah, I agree. Okay, Mary, hi, I'm bilingual from my first two. <laughs> That's cute. Um, Non-natives are now now underscore in Mexico. What would you ad, advi, uh, advise in order to teach Latin, Spanish, and instead in USA? Uh, spent six years. Okay, so I, I'm. Are you asking me how I would teach students in Mexico rather than students who um, have an intention of living in the United States? I don't know. I've I've not done that. I have students from about 10 different countries. Uh, all of them, uh, not all of them live in the United States, but all of them are focused on being in the United States. So um, I'm sorry, I can't just do that. My only Chinese student, I taught an Armenian uh, kindergarten teacher who was living in China. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's it. Uh, my students are, um, I've, I've, I've had students in Saudi Arabia. I have students from Venezuela who live here. I have uh, I have an attorney in Guadalajara. Uh, I have another student in Mexico. I have a couple in Colombia, and uh, but they all have uh, at least they perceive they have a need to come to the United States, and so that's why they're taking the TOEFL. So I, I guess I didn't really answer that. What what company do you use to create and host your website? Well, I built my own website. Um, Hosting, I, I use a company called Host Monster. Um, they're, I think, an affiliate, or not an affiliate, a subsidiary of Bluehost. There's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, I, I don't have, I, I've been using Host Monster since, um, I said earlier, I built my first website in 1994. Uh, so, uh, and I do, I use WordPress. I don't use these things like uh, all these free ones. Um, I do it myself. I like to do it. Uh, I don't think the learning curve is too hard for most people, uh, so so I do that. Uh, and I think you can do it too. I I think it's pretty pretty easy, not easy, but it's pretty doable. All right. Let's see. Uh, so. Yeah, so Mary, I'm sorry, I guess I just didn't really understand your your question. Since non-natives are now underscore in Mexico, what would you advise in order to teach Latin Spanish instead in you? Oh, in the USA, I'm sorry, so I missed that. Um, well, I don't know, I don't teach Spanish. Um, uh, Yo hablo español, but I tell everybody I, I falta la gramática, vocabulario y pronunciación. Other than that, I'm fluent. If I could conjugate, pronounce, and have some vocabulary, I'd be even better. All right, so I guess um, let me scroll up. So, and I, I don't want to tell you there's only one run, shoot, one right way to do this. Um, Things that work for me work for me. I don't, I, but I've done things that didn't work. I'm, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> um, I don't know what else. What did I miss? Is there anything else that I miss? Anything? I. 
think I think I did. Uh, if there's anybody still there and you have a question, uh, feel free to ask. If you are interested in uh, another 30 minutes or so with me, um, there's the the place where you can make that appointment. Uh, free placement evaluation. Actually, <laughs> that's not it. That's not where I want you to go. Oh, I didn't publish it, so so that's not where I want you to go. Let me let me find out the link to that um, if you want to hang on. Okay, Caesar, you can help her with that. Good, do it, because <laughs> I clearly didn't understand what we were trying to do. Um, Oh, I'm just going to give you the link to the, the ESL evaluation that I I do. I don't really have a I have a dedicated one, but I don't really use it so much. So let me. Yeah. So if you want, you can schedule, and I'll spend a half an hour. I won't build your website, uh, and I won't uh, charge you anything either. Uh, so so. I don't know, Caesar, if you use Caesar Assessor. Uh, I've got relatives who do it both ways, I guess kind of depending on where they live. Um, and there you can make, make the appointment. That's, that's it. So if there's other questions, if, if you want to ask them, I'm happy. If not, um, I don't actually have my next class for about two hours, but um, I might want to get a drink of water or a cup of coffee. All right, so at, at that point, I think... I think we're done. Uh, we could have probably talked a little more, more about lead magnets, um, but uh, I guess that's it. So I appreciate everyone who took the time. I appreciate uh, Chris and Sarah, both Chris's, Chris with a K, Chris with an S. Uh, yes, yeah, they both, <laughs> you have an S, of course. Chris with a C, Chris with a K, and Sarah, I uh, appreciate you setting this up for me. I see Caesar's link in there. So uh, copy that if you need to uh, to talk to him. And uh, I I knew how to start this. I'm not sure I know how to log off, <laughs> but that's what I'm going to try and do. All right. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Take care now. Bye bye. You're welcome, John.